Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but on this past Saturday's podcast, I believe I said when talking about the disappointment that we all felt after The Rock, or I'm sorry, in Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes segment on SmackDown. And I said that let's not panic. This was one segment that we didn't really love. This was one segment that we felt lacked a little bit of fire, emotion, enthusiasm, WrestleMania spirit, that type of thing. And I was optimistic. I said, we still have a couple of more weeks. We still have like four or five more TVs until we get to WrestleMania. Let's not we'll let one segment ruin this entire story for us. I don't even think I was expecting what we saw tonight on Monday Night Raw. You talk about a WrestleMania season Raw. This is, to me, what should epitomize a WrestleMania season Raw. I made four separate thumbnails for tonight's show because shit just kept happening. I had my placeholder thumbnail up all week. Then The Rock comes out and surprises us, shows up unannounced. He's advertised for next week's Raw. He just showed up tonight in Chicago randomly dropped a little big you know storyline twist there with the whisper to cody so then i'm like great there's my thumbnail and then about an hour later cm punk and drew mcintyre and seth rollins get out there and they fucking kick ass and i'm like okay there's my thumbnail and then at the very end of the show the rock is still there and attacks cody rhodes backstage bloodies him up beats him up in the rain right next to his bus in the parking lot bloodies cody up we saw multiple curse words tonight on raw uh, we saw blood tonight on Raw. This was one hell of a buildup for WrestleMania. And this on honestly should have been the go-home show. I mean, th this is what we should have seen next week. But tonight, they were in Chicago. They were in the Allstate Arena. And we all know what a great arena and market Chicago is in general. But specifically, this arena has been the home to some of WWE's biggest moments throughout their history. And, and I'm really happy that we got a Raw of this magnitude tonight because... Everybody just felt like they were on the same page. It was so refreshing. It felt so good as a fan to watch that because you guys have been with me for so many years. How many years? Year after year, are we up here on like a Monday night during WrestleMania season? And we say the same shit every year. We say, this doesn't feel like a WrestleMania Raw. They just feel like it's just, it's underwhelming and it just lacks you know, emotion and story and everything, really. It's been just sucking ass for, like, the past 15 years. And now things have really been turned in the corner. WWE is a business in terms of creative, are white hot. They have a lot of over-wrestlers, over-babies' faces, over-heels, attendance through the roof, ratings are good, fan interest is good, and they're going into a big milestone WrestleMania here with a pretty stacked fucking card. And I've been really excited and stoked for the show all along, although we have had a couple of uh, speed bumps and roadblocks along the way that have all rectified themselves. And then the latest one on Friday, when we didn't really get this segment out of Roman and Cody that we were expecting or that maybe we were hoping to get. And then we just fast forward 72 hours. It's Monday Night Raw. It's in Chicago, a show that I was already expecting to be good because CM Punk was returning on the show. We knew he was going to be involved with McIntyre and possibly Rollins. So that was one thing. But I don't think I was even expecting uh, to see as much as we saw here. And The Rock basically opening and closing the show. You know, they even fooled the, they even fooled the online fans because even when Rock came out earlier... You know, the way he came out, we'll talk about this, you know, as we go through Raw here tonight, but the way The Rock came out so deliberately, he came out, not a whole, none of the thing on the, you know, the goosebumps, he just came straight out there, kind of head down, walked right to the ring, said his piece to Cody, and then left. And I was like, wow, that's just something you don't see from The Rock, just come in and say nothing and then leave. And I'm like, well, they probably booked that segment in the opening to open the show so Rock can get the fuck out of there. But he hung around all night. And that's something that I think WWE did very well is making me as a fan think, oh, Rock is already on his private jet off to wherever. We're probably not even going to see Cody or The Rock for the rest of the night because the main event was Jay, was, uh, I'm sorry, Shinsuke Nakamura and Sami Zayn. So how the fuck we finished with Rock and Cody Rhodes, I'll have no idea. but Or I have no idea, but we did. And that was what what I think was one of the great things about tonight's Raw is because they surprised us multiple times. And on top of that, they gave us, I think they, uh, you know, over-delivered in some of their advertised segments. We knew we were going to get something between Punk and McIntyre. We knew that. I don't think any of us thought it would be as good as it was. And then Rollins coming out there, I thought was going to ruin it because Punk and Drew had already had such a great back and forth, but Seth made it better. I mean, everything was great tonight. Even Becky Lynch. 
Becky Lynch, you know, who, you know, got to you with her emotion talking about her daughter and how her father never got to meet her, you know, and it, even that was that sometimes stuff like that has a tendency to be cringy. We've seen, you know, when wrestlers family have been brought up before, you know, sons or daughters or even, you know, passed away brothers or passed away family members. It always just comes off as cringy, cheap, heaty and things like that. And and, and Becky's was believable. You know, I felt for her. I kind of wanted her to knock Rhea's fucking head off. So I I liked a lot of what we saw tonight on Raw. And I would say most of what I liked was not in the ring wrestling. It was promo stuff. It was story stuff. But the in-ring stuff was really good. That Ricochet and JD match was 10 times better than it needed to be. This is what WrestleMania season is all about. This is what I've been yearning for for uh, since I was in my fucking 20s, man, is just to have good, exciting, fun Monday Night Raws leading up to WrestleMania. I thought next week for the go-home show with Raw, with Rock being on the show, next Monday would be kind of like an automatic, pretty solid show. I wasn't expecting to get the show we got tonight. I knew it would be good. Chicago, Punk's advertised. We knew we were going to have some shit there. But I think tonight's Raw really <laughs> exceeded expectations. And I enjoyed pretty much watching wrestling for the entire three hours tonight. And I don't know how how long it's been since I've actually said that and meant it, you know? So, hell of a show tonight, guys. And we're going to be breaking it down here in a minute. But I just wanted to come up here briefly and say my piece. It took me a few extra minutes to get up here and get live because I'm like, oh, shit, what thumbnail do I use? Do I want to get a bloody Cody on the thing? I, oh, my. It was one of those nights. It was one of those nights as a YouTuber where you find yourself making four fucking thumbnails for the same video. So it was one of those tonight. Hope you guys are having a great Monday. Happy Monday to you. WrestleMania season rolls on here on the channel. It's been another long one. We dropped a YouTube collab on Friday. We were up here for the podcast on Saturday. We had a watch along last night, and now we're back for a Raw review, and we're going to talk all about it here. So first thing I'm going to do is cruise to the chat, say hello to people that are here. I'm also going to refresh this video so I can get a good look at who's here, uh, could really use the likes and that stuff. So please smash that thumbs up button for me. I would really appreciate it. And we will get into Monday Night Raw here in just a moment. But let me say hi to people who are already here hanging out, waiting for us, like <clears throat> channel members such as J.D. Jones. We got J.J. Leg as well, Jay Lambo, Zach Palgett is here, Joshua Aparicio in the house, Rock whispering to Cody, do you like pie? You know, I thought whatever, I, don't, I still don't know what he whispered to him. I wasn't expecting to see The Rock again. I thought Rock whispering something to Cody was going to be, you know, some big secret that we as fans were going to have to figure out and decipher. And then The Rock wound up attacking Cody at the end of the show. So I don't know if the whisper even made in, meant anything at all. But you would think uh, next week, Cody's going to have some shit to say. Uh, Bo Klavlovic, good to see you as well. Deshaun Robinson in the house. And how wheezy, 19 month member what an ending to raw that is true also good to see my friend deshaun robinson in the house this is exactly what we needed for mania i agree we got michael cuomo denny down bat and the juliet more channel members that i see off the bat here and also uh did i get yeah i got you already uh good to see who else i'm looking for channel members first there's a couple more there's max pokey bruh and there is barry MK hitting us with five. Cody got beat up for six minutes. I can't wait for Roman to beat him two nights in a row. I wouldn't hold your breath on that one, Barry. Uh, I think uh, tonight was just more indication that Cody will, in fact, be finishing that story at WrestleMania. Also good to see uh, Ohio State Boise fan in here. Or Ohio Boise fan. I still can't say your name properly. Uh, good to see Roman Stone. Gamer Gooner. We got Ram K. Andrew McGrum. Stephen Harris is in the house. Green P. Brian Lee T. Michael Mirville, seventh season, Doug Unfunny. We've got Gotcha Carnival is here as well. We got Jay Boba with a very nice $5 drop. Thank you so much, my friend. Best Raw in a long time. I agree, dude. Uh, the Rock and Cody seven just proved they have more chemistry at this point than Roman and Cody together. I mean, what was interesting about tonight's show is it felt like it, it felt like the matches at WrestleMania are Cody versus The Rock and Seth Rollins, or I'm sorry, CM Punk versus Drew McIntyre. Th those were the two matches that I was excited to see, and neither one of them are booked for the show. Cody and Rock kind of is, but they're in a tag. Uh, and it does have, it has WrestleMania 27 vibes, but in a good way. WrestleMania 27 sucked because The Miz was really shoved into the, you know, background there, and it didn't even feel like he was a part of the match, and he was the fucking champion. 
Roman Reigns is kind of getting that treatment as well, although he's Roman Reigns and Miz was the Miz. So you can only you can you can only shove Roman so far in the background. It's kind of hard to really push him completely out of the spotlight. So I wouldn't say he's, you know, an afterthought in this, but he's getting close. And what we saw from Rock and Cody tonight <sighs> makes me wonder. No, they wouldn't do that. I'm about to say, you know, would Cody beat Roman on night one in the tag match or something? And then Rock's like, Roman, I'm going to go defend your titles on night two. And then we get Cody and and Rock. No, that's too much. That's too much thinking. We got we to get into what we're talking about tonight first. But I do agree that as exciting as tonight was to see Cody and The Rock interact and how intense that was, you know, and Rock targeting Cody's mom and stuff. This is The Rock doing this stuff, not Roman Reigns, which is who his opponent is supposed to be. So it's like, it's good and bad, even though this is very, very awesome and fun television. You know, I do this whole story of getting Cody Rhodes back to Roman Reigns is, uh, you know, really kind of being overshadowed by just The Rock's presence in general. And uh, it's not all it's not all bad, but it's definitely uh, uh, not all good either. Uh, Sonic plays. What's up? Good to see you. David Brown, happy to see you. First name John is here as well, along with T85. Diego Luis Diet Water, right on. Fucking nuts raw. David Sims in the house. Shell Shock Sublime Shape. Uh, who else? Oh, wait, I want to read what you said here. Uh, I haven't watched, I haven't watched isn't of the mania buildup because. Oh, never mind. I thought that was going to be an inter more interesting uh, comment. Uh, Diego Luis, thank you for the five bucks. Mama Rhodes. And of course, Mama Rhodes might be getting that bloody belt early as The Rock did put some of Cody's blood on that belt when he was beating the shit out of him by Cody's own bus. Fucking too good, man. Good to see Ajax Johnson. Uh, Fleming, I'm just reading the last part of your name there. I'm just going to go with Fleming on that one. Uh, Rodrigo Martinez is here as well. Vash Starwind. Also, good to see you. People do that for Sammy. Not sure what that's referencing, but anyway, good to see everybody here. If I missed any Super Chats or anything like that, please let me know. We will get to those at the end of the show. This is your Monday Night Raw review for March 25th, 2024. Raw tonight was from the Allstate Arena in Chicago, Illinois. We already knew that. CM Punk was going to be advertised for the show. Drew McIntyre has been doing a marvelous job of just trolling the shit out of CM Punk. So we knew we were going to get something between those, do those two gentlemen tonight, especially with Drew McIntyre uh, rolling through Chicago today and stopping by Mindy's Bakery. <laughs> what a troll. He just will not let up. Uh, so I was already excited and felt it was definitely going to be worth coming up and doing a Raw review tonight just on the strength of that advertisement alone. But we got so much more, so much more. So let's start talking about it, shall we? Tonight's Monday Night Raw opened up with Cody Rhodes. So Cody Rhodes comes out and he's got his suit on, no sports coat, just the vest and the tie and the pants and all of that. So I wanted to hear something good from Cody tonight because on SmackDown, I didn't love a lot of that, especially the fact that, you know, he, he wanted to shake Roman's hand and, you know, he's, he, he seems a little bit more fed up uh, with the bloodline. And so the fact that him and Roman didn't have some, you know, crazy pull apart, kind of like Becky and Rhea did tonight, I thought was kind of a letdown. And I think we really need to get to that, uh, you know, next week, or I guess on the go home go home raw next week, you know, because even on the final SmackDown, they're probably not going to do anything too crazy, right? Because I mean, shit, they might have to do the contract signing, but that's that go home SmackDown, a lot going on. You got, you got the hall of fame coming in there right after, you know, I feel like the, the next, the next two big TVs are going to be this upcoming SmackDown and next week's raw. So uh, I don't know if we're going to try to do a contract signing at that point or what, but based on what we saw on Friday, I really wanted to see, a little more angered, a little more intense, a little more uh, not playing games Cody Rhodes because that's what I thought we got out of him last week when he cut his promo, and then it kind of didn't turn out to be that. So I needed something out of Cody tonight. And he comes down to the ring, and this he had a good promo in Chicago. I really liked it. The crowd went nuts for uh, Cody Rhodes. They gave him the big whoa. Incidentally, the crowd in Chicago tonight was fucking huge. They uh, used their... 
minimalist uh, raw set. So it was kind of a different stage setup. It was basically designed to allow the entire uh, arena to be filled and even put people behind the Tron. So it was a little bit lower so you could see over the top of it. And it was a sold out house. 15,000 people in the Allstate Arena tonight. So that was badass. And that arena, of course, the home of WrestleMania 13, Bret and Austin, the home of Money in the Bank, Punk and Cena. A lot of great moments and a lot of big time matches have taken place in this very arena. But like I said, I don't think even I was prepared for what we saw here tonight. So Cody comes out, gets in the ring. He talks about Roman Reigns first. He talks about uh, Roman Reigns making the media rounds. He shouts out Pat McAfee and Michael Cole and gets the fans to show them some love. And he responded to Roman, who I think was on Pat McAfee's show. I have not seen that, by the way. Uh, but he responded to Roman's comments on Pat McAfee, calling him a politician and saying that Cody's making promises that he can't keep. And uh, Cody, you know, basically, I, I liked all this. He, you know, his response to Roman was like, you know, he, he rolled through some of the things that he does that he likes to do for the fans, for the audience, for the WWE universe. He said that he's going to be a best man at a guy's wedding. He's going to a five-year-old's birthday party. He's sending the wrestling club to WrestleMania. He hangs out every single night after the show in the ring and, you know, uh, interacts with the fans. He does all of that not because he wants a thank you or he wants praise. He does these things and he pretends to be the champion because the champion isn't here. And I loved that. I really, really loved that line because, you know, it's kind of twofold. Not only, you know, did he really hit the nail on the head there. Also, that could be some ammo for Seth Rollins if these two have a future program. Seth's like, you said you pretend to be the champion because the champion isn't here. What the fuck do you think I am and have been trying to do since last year when I won this title? I'm trying to be the replacement for Roman Reigns. And here you're, you know, who that, that could maybe create some issues between them down the line. We'll have to see. But I did like that. And he said that even though he respects Roman, he said, make no mistake about it. I hate your guts. So I guess that was kind of their response, his response to some of the fans being like, yo, bro, what the fuck? Why did you want to shake his hand on Friday when all of this stuff has been going on, especially how they robbed you of the title last year? And, you know, and you still trying to show this guy respect is a little bit ridiculous. And Cody did say that, make no mistake about it. He hates his guts. And then he kind of turned his attention to The Rock. And he said, my favorite thing that he said about Roman and Rock, and he said, I'm sorry that you and your cousin can't have the wank fest at WrestleMania that you wanted to have. Uh, and so Cody said he's going to ask all of them. He doesn't like to ask the fans for anything, but he's going to ask all of us to go on the ride with him as he finishes his journey and story at WrestleMania and wins the title. And then he wants everybody to point to the WrestleMania sign with him. So that was like my first indication or my first thought that, okay, that this segment is over. That's all that we were going to get because I thought it was a really cool visual of Cody and all of the fans pointing to the WrestleMania sign. I even said to myself, oh, that's going to make a really good thumbnail. <laughs> and uh, and as soon as he uh, starts doing the pointing, The Rock's music hits out of nowhere. I thought it was going to be a fake out. I thought it was going to be, you know, The Rock's music hitting and then it was going to turn out to be McIntyre trolling or something like that. But no, it actually was The Rock. He came right out, didn't stall a lot, didn't do a lot of that fucking goosebump shit that he's been doing. He kind of came right out, and they, the camera switched to where it was focused right on the entrance. It actually looked like it was the hard cam, but with the entrance, kind of like how they were doing at the pandemic in the uh, Performance Center. And I really like that camera angle of right on the entrance there with The Rock and the lightning bolts and him coming out. And instead of you know, really soaking it up in Chicago. He kind of had his head down and he was walking straight to the ring, like with a purpose and got in the ring, got face to face with Cody. He kind of did this first. He like opened his arms to like hug him. And then he put his arms behind his back, like hit me, you know, and both of those times and Brock has done a couple of things during this build. That's made me think like, are they trying to tell us that rock has some sort of leverage on him? You know, and then w that's what I've been thinking all along. And then when Cody doesn't move, he just stares at the rock. Rock is not reaching for a mic. Rock's not here to say anything. He just walks up and approaches Cody and he just whispers something to Cody. And Cody kind of definitely looks like he was taken aback by it. And then rock just gets out of the ring and leaves. And that, you know, kind of fueled this, this theory in my head that I'm like, does rock have some, I don't know what the fuck it could be, what kind of leverage it could be, you know, but does rock have something on Cody you know, that he can use or that he's holding over his head or, you know, he's going to use to 
get what he wants? Like, what would he have to say to Cody that would make Cody like, you do what I say or I'm going to fire you? You know, are we going back to that again? Then we're just doing like authority shit stuff. I feel like it's got to be better than that. I feel like Cody is a character. His his character should know better that should know better than to believe the rock if he just says i'm your boss i can fire you okay well let me just call up the tko and ask to speak to the manager and find out if that's true you know so i don't know if cody's just gonna take his word for that you know so if, if rock is like i can fire you then cody should be like do it do it then you explain to the tko board why you've just ruined your wrestlemania 40 main event so i'm not sure if it's the firing thing that he's holding over his head if he's holding over his anything over his head at all unless it's something to do with his family but again you know you would think if the rock you know said something threatening to cody's ma about cody's family or mom or daughter cody wouldn't just take that he'd probably fucking lose his mind and just you know attack and pounce so that was awesome because that left me wondering what the fuck that was about. And that left me thinking that I'm not going to get any answers to that probably until at least next Monday night on Raw on the go home. Because I don't know what's going on on Friday night, but Cody probably will not be on the show. I don't know if The Rock is advertised for Friday. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But I, I just wasn't thinking that we were going to get any answers as to what that whisper was until at least next week. So us... Them leaving us with that just kind of added more. And that's why, you know, when I was talking about over the past couple of weeks how much I want the night two match between Roman and Cody to really be bonkers. I mean, it's got to be bloodline rules. We know that. So Rock and Roman need to find a way to win on night one. Make that night two match bloodline rules. That way everything can happen and everybody can get involved. And I was calling out Cody's mom getting involved in this before The Rock called her out. I was the first one to say that I need her in the ring hitting a shooting star press on Roman Reigns, and then Rock started targeting her. So I already had Ro Cody's mom involved in this thing as it is before Rock even called her out. And now with this potential whisper, it makes you wonder what else they're going to kind of pile onto this thing. And it really does look like between the dynamic and the chemistry between Rock and Cody, and then, of course, we have Cody and Roman, the big rematch, you know, the wild cards and Seth Rollins and CM Punk and everything just going on WrestleMania weekend, even Cody's allies, Sammy, Jey Uso, you got to take all those people into account and into consideration. By the time we get to that night two main event, I hope this is just all part of it. And I could see, you know, like why would, unless they explain this, unless when Rock was kicking Cody's ass tonight, he was explaining what it was that he whispered to him. Uh, because right after he whispered that to Cody as the Rock is leaving, um, I forgot her name. What's her face? Uh, catches up with Rock backstage and she says rock what did you say to cody rhodes and rock goes why don't you just ask cody so it doesn't sound like rock is saying that it needs to be a big secret ask cody what i said um so it feels like you know it could be adding you know yet another layer or something to take into consideration for the main event because why would they do the thing where rock whisper something to Cody if it wasn't going to mean anything. So maybe in the night two main in the night two main event that is bloodline rules, there's a there's a situation there, you know, Roman is is down, Cody's got Roman down and there's no bloodline members really around. Maybe they've all been neutralized by Jey Uso or anybody that Cody has on his side and you got Roman down in the ring and Cody's standing over him with a chair. He basically has the match won and Rock kind of gets in the ring and goes to whisper to him again maybe, you know, threatening him or, or holding whatever he's got over his head to, you know, walk away or not go through with beating Roman. I don't know. And that's when Cody is like, no. And then he smacks rock or whatever. Still also possible that, you know, uh, or it was possible up until this point that maybe, you know, the rock could be a double agent, but if that's not the case, they did a really good job of, you know, hammering that home here because if rock is going to be a double agent and him and Cody are in cahoots, that means Cody's going to have to be willing to take a bloody ass kicking in the cold Chicago rain, you know, all just for a ruse, all for an act. I feel like after tonight's bloody brawl, you can kind of rule out the double agent thing for the rock, not ruling out him turning babyface again, but this idea that he's been in cahoots with Cody the whole time is probably not the case anymore. Or never really was to begin with, but we can probably even rule that one out. So I think this just adds more excitement. And even though I feel like the story of Roman and Cody meeting again does feel like it is a little bit buried out of 
underneath a lot of the other things surrounding the main event and the bloodline and the two champions and Cody Rhodes, I feel like they can still make it great. You know, like we've talked about it. Is the rock overshadowing all of this? I think we're going to learn a lot at WrestleMania. I think WrestleMania, that main event on night two between Cody and Roman, I predict that at the end of it, we're going to forget that we ever thought for a second that that mass match has lost its luster or steam or interest because I think they are really going to go over the top with this match. I really hope that they do uh, because if Cody were to finish a story and win and he does it in a way that is just crazy and bonkers and overbooked and, and you know, a million people interfering and lots of chaos, that's what I want to see. That's the type of title win I want to see him have. Sometimes you want to see somebody just go in the ring, beat somebody clean. But in this case, you know, his his father is a guy that was famous for a lot of nutty finishes too. And I think that would just be such a perfect uh, homage to not only Dusty, but, you know, just wrestling in general. And I've said this before, I feel like the 40th WrestleMania, your main event to that, it should be, the whole main event should just be a, a, a love letter, love letter to pro wrestling. This is what makes pro wrestling great. Cody and Roman and Rock and everybody involved there are going to show you how much of a movie wrestling can really be. Remember Vince and Beyond the Mat? We make movies. Well, I think they're going to make one on night two at WrestleMania 40 because it's they're setting up a lot of stuff here. All that was really good. So that was that was enough. And I'm not going to wait to get to the end of the show to talk about the rest of this because at the end of the show... The main event is Sami Zayn and Shinsuke Nakamura. We've already had the the Drew McIntyre and, and CM Punk and Rollins stuff. We've already had Becky and Rhea Ripley. We've had a great night of wrestling. Then it's capped off with Nakamura and uh, I'm not not Sami Zayn uh, with Nakamura and who the fuck Jey Uso, Jey Uso and Nakamura in the main event. And I was just not expecting to see what we saw. So then after the match. We get Jay, you know, winning with a spear. The bloodline had already showed up. K Cody was brawling with, I think, Jimmy Uso backstage. So then after the match, the cameras catch back up with Cody and Jay. And Solo was there, too, I think, brawling around. Because Rollins is out there with uh, having uh, having Jay's back, too. He said so at Gorilla before the match. And so as Cody is fighting with Jay... He's hit from behind, like in the right where the, the doors to the, the or back doors to the arena lead out into the parking garage where everybody's buses and rental cars are. They just that's where Jimmy and Cody are brawling. And then from behind, he just gets blasted by the rock. And to hear the fans through the camera react to that. Holy shit. You know, twice now we've holy shit at ourselves because of the rock. That means the rock hung around and stayed there all night to be a part of this final segment. He attacks Cody, and then it's just Rock and Cody. He hits him with a trash can, throws him up against a guardrail, then throws him through the doors. It's raining. He rips Cody's shirt off. Now Cody's shirtless, laying in the cold, rain on the pavement, right next to his bus. Rock is smacking him around, punching him, kicking him. Cody gets uh, busted open. He's got blood all over his forehead. Rock is talking to the camera during the whole thing. And he's talking to Mama Rhodes, and then he pulls off his uh, his weight belt that's all white, and it says Mama Rhodes on it. And he lifts up Cody, and he's got him by his bloody face, and he's just like looking right, so fucking intense. And he puts him down, and then he's got the belt, and he puts some of Cody's blood on the belt, and he basically makes the belt for Mama Rhodes that he promised to give her at WrestleMania uh, in uh, when he faces Cody. So he's basically got that belt already for Mama Rhodes, and. That is what I needed. That's exactly what I needed for this WrestleMania, especially after what we saw on Friday night. I needed something like this. Now, granted, Cody and Roman still need to do something great, and that's why I'm hoping we get that either next week or on Friday or whatever. Uh, and I think if we don't, if we don't get anything too intense between Cody and Roman, shit, man, I might do it the other way around. I might have Rock stay heel and Roman go babyface. You know, especially if Roman... Roman's still being Roman, but Roman's not being quite as vicious as The Rock. You know, and so if him and Cody, you know, just have their match, I feel like that is... it. Things where we sit right now and where we stand, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you feel the same way, but I feel like it feels more likely that Roman is closer to a babyface turn than The Rock. 
because Roman can, you know, cite all of the rocks bullshit him coming in his inflated ego his douchebag attitude taking the spotlight away from literally everybody near damn near the whole fucking company for this wrestlemania and that's where you set up the match for the true tribal chief crown or whatever and that can be next year can be in a few months who knows but i feel like roman is closer to being a babyface than rock is at this point and that's good stuff man rock was it was cool to see him in this way. Like, even when he was back with Cena and stuff 10 years ago, we weren't seeing shit like this from him. Uh, so this is different. I'm glad that we're not seeing 2011, 12, and 13 Rock just back in its same form 10 years later. He's different. He's a heel. He's a fucking shithead. And he's great at it. And... I'm not going to want him to leave when WrestleMania is over. My God, this was all sorts of good. And as a big Cody fan, you know, and somebody who wants to see Cody finish his story and doesn't want to see Cody, you know, lose steam with the audience or whatnot, I'm not feeling like he is. I feel like this is, you know, just more heat for The Rock. Now bringing Cody's mom into it. And you would think that now Cody has got to be blinded by rage, you would think, after this beatdown. And how he's going to respond to this, whether it be SmackDown on Friday or next week when we know Rock and Roman Reigns both will be in the building on Raw. And you know Cody and Seth will be there too. So something big is going to happen next week. Maybe Cody, you know, and maybe if you do like the 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 wrestling math, you know, Rock got the, the upper hand on Cody tonight. Maybe Cody gets the upper hand on Rock next week on the go home, putting Rock down, maybe embarrassing the Rock, something like that. I would embarrass the Rock next week on the go-home show. Then, on the night one, tag team match main event, I've been adamant ever since they've announced this match that the finish needs to be The Rock pinning Cody. That is the finish, because that's the finish that will take your story beyond WrestleMania if Cody finishes his story and beats Roman on night two. You have The Rock to pin Cody on night one. Cody beats Roman on night two for the championship, and now Rock is like, hey, I did my job. I beat Cody. You lost to him. And then boom, and then you're all set to go. You're off to the races with those two uh, is kind of the way I would do it. Unless WWE has much bigger plans uh, than that for Rock and Roman and, and everybody involved. But I still think that would be the finish I'd go with having Rock beat Cody, bloodline rules on night two, and then Cody wins the title. Be the same thing as Brett losing to Owen, getting injured, more animosity or more more adversity, I should say, and uh and obstacles, you know, thrown in front of him and still is able to find a way in that main event to still win the championship despite everything against him. The deck stacked against him the way it is. That's the way I would do it, so we will see. But that was good stuff tonight from Cody and The Rock. I really, really enjoyed that, and I really enjoyed the surprise of The Rock being here. I cannot recall a time that I was surprised. Like, Rock's made some surprise appearances before, but never one that was this important, you know? Because Rock has turned up and said, you know, Rock has turned up for various uh promos before and appearances and he's done things with eugene and you know random just hello i'm here i was in the building for the first smackdown on fox in la when he came out and humiliated uh baron corbin so sometimes rock turns up and does stuff but this was a whole different level of surprise and i loved it i fucking loved it man it was good stuff but we will be talking more about it, uh, especially I want to see what you guys have to say about this. Let me just answer. Oh, there we go. I was going to answer this text message, but I am good. Um, yeah, DJ Solo. And I like that's what I liked about The Rock is that he did feel evil. He felt evil. I like him to feel evil. It's great. He's good at it. I wasn't sure. Like, you know, The Rock is beating the shit out of Cody, bloodying him, him up, wearing that vest and those glasses. I mean, come on. That was a little bit ridiculous. I would not be wanting to get my ass kicked by a man wearing a vest like that. But Cody did. It built a lot of heat and... I'm excited. I'm excited for Mania, guys. By the way, check out my WrestleMania 40 season playlist on the channel right now. All of our WrestleMania weekend live stream links are there. We're going to be doing a watch party of night one and night two. So please join us. Links are up. Check them out. Set your notifications and be here with me to party on uh, WrestleMania weekend at night one and two because it's going to be something else, man. My God. But there was a lot more that happened on Monday Night Raw than just that. So we do have to get into the rest of it. Give myself a refresh here. Please do me a favor and keep smashing that thumbs up button for me, and I'd very much appreciate it.
I feel like we had maybe five matches on the show tonight. Something like that. Yeah, we Felt like it. And the first one was a dandy. That's what Jim Ross would have said. This one right here is a dandy. And it was J.D. McDugent, J.D. McNugent, that's what I call him, against uh, Ricochet. Now, J.D.'s kind of been on the shit list with the Judgment Day because he lost the gauntlet thing and then he didn't take care of business last week, so they're all getting on his case. And the Judgment Day was backstage. They all had a little, a little gathering. And I laugh. I've said this before. I laugh at every one of these little uh, Judgment Day circle jerks backstage because at what point, at what point is one of Damian Priest's faction mates or stable mates going to be like, bro, WrestleMania, you got like four chances. You got two chances on each night to win the title and cash in your briefcase. You better be thinking about that. And I, in the last three podcasts, I've spoke for five minutes plus each about this and how important it is that they, uh, that, they tell a story here with Damian Priest, whether he cashes in that briefcase or not, because this would not make any sense for his character for him to not at least try at WrestleMania. So that's another thing. Every time we talk about all of these scenarios with Seth and Drew and Cody and Roman and all of that, you got to remember Priest is still there and you can't rule him out. He's going to be a part of something at WrestleMania. He has to. So now it's JD against Ricochet. Ricochet is just fucking tremendous. This match was nuts, and it was way better than it even had to be. These guys are both great athletes. They're great workers. Obviously, just a match between these two is, are, these two is going to be naturally good, uh, but this one was just a little bit extra bonkers. I think Dominic was out there for this one, too. Uh, we, we had a top rope poison Rana, which was just ridiculous. We had uh, Ricochet countering a wrist lock into a destroyer. Don't see that every day. And the finish was him hitting the shooting star press, but not landing on his opponent when he's on his back, landing is on his opponent when he's standing up, but he basically just hit like a shooting star high cross body for the win. High cross takedown, pins JD, and wins the match. Awesome win there for uh, Ricochet. And I can't believe how long he's been in the company. And aside from, you know, he's had an IC title run and whatnot, he, he was the guy Gunther beat for the title. He just you know, has never really been pushed as a major, major guy. And I just think that that's been crazy because he can do some crazy things. He's a lot like Will Ospreay in that regard, where sometimes he just kind of defies logic and gravity. And you still, he's still at peak physical form. I mean, at some point, these ricochets and these Montez Fords and these Carmelo Hayes, they age, you know, and you can't be doing this crazy shit forever. So you should capitalize on all these guys on these guys while they're in their physical primes and uh, would like to see a little bit more for Ricochet in the company one day soon. That would be nice, but really good match there with JD Mc McNugent. All right. After that was the big CM Punk promo CM Punk back in Chicago, returning to Chicago, his home town, which I'm sure he just had to make a short car ride over to the arena this is the same arena, of course, that he returned at into in Survivor Series in 2023 last year, a few months ago. And this is also where he beat John Cena at Money in the Bank and also where he showed up to last summer while he was still under AEW contract, trying to get a job and smooth things over and then patch up some bridges in WWE. You knew something was up there. And man, this punk promo was interesting. I mean, God, there was so much going on here. I cannot wait. Uh, I hope uh, like Fightful Select will drop a report on this tomorrow, what they heard, what they know about it. And I'm curious how much of the promo segment here we saw between all three of these guys was improvised or not, because man, they were just, <laughs> they were just having some jabs at each other. There was a hitting like just lefts and rights and lefts and rights. And nobody was hesitating and everybody was landing their punches. Everything was hitting. Everything was landing so good. So Punk comes out, cult of personality. He looks pretty good. Arm is in a thing. And he says that, you know, unfortunately he is not 100%, but he will be at WrestleMania. He said, people are asking me if I will be at WrestleMania. The short answer is yes, but he doesn't really totally know what he's going to be doing. And he called out uh, Pat McAfee. Uh, I forgot why Pat McAfee had, did he have somebody on his podcast? I forgot what he, why he called out Pat. But this is the line that kind of made me uh, snicker here. He calls out Pat McAfee and he goes, oh, I don't know. I don't really watch your show. I listen to the drive-thru and the experience. 
<laughs> so not a shocker that CM Punk listens to those shows. Of course he does. I think we all knew that. Uh, you know, at least I, I find, uh, you know, I find Cornette's shtick to be horribly tired. Uh, I don't listen to him at all. I just don't understand why you would make money on hate and you would make a living off preying upon the lowest common denominator of fans. Just not my thing. But at least with CM Punk, he has a reason. <laughs> at least with CM Punk, he has a reason to hate listen to somebody or to hate watch a product. Well, I guess he's not hate listening to Cornette, but he has a reason to listen to somebody like Cornette trash AEW because he's pissed. He's, you know, he's a, he used to work there. He had a terrible experience there. You know, he had two, you know, major backstage fights, wound up being terminated and literally just despised his entire run there. It felt like, and he really ended things badly with the elite and the bucks and, you know, there were fights and the jungle boy thing and all that crap. It was just such a fucking disaster. So if you are CM Punk, if you are living CM Punk's life, living in CM Punk's shoes, I could see tuning in Cornette and laughing and giggling about how much he's shitting on AEW because I used to work there and I know these people for real and I know I had a bad experience there so it makes me happy to hear people shit on him. But I don't know what Johnny Assboy 56 uh, with uh, 24 followers is so mad about. I don't know what his issue is. <laughs> uh, with CM Punk, I can kind of understand, you know, because he had a terrible experience there. So dropping the podcast names of Cornette on WWE Raw is crazy because, I mean, even though WWE is AEW's competitor, even though I'm sure WWE loves it when the, when AEW is suffering turmoil or going through the mud or going through the shit, I'm sure they love it over there. Uh, that type of, you know, just, just vibe and, and demeanor on your podcast to where you're so over the top with your hate that you just make shit up and you say a lot of horrible things about wrestlers you don't know, about careers you don't understand, and it's fucked up. I don't I don't have any respect for his opinions in that regard at all because they're not opinions. They're just straight hate. And fans like to whack off at that. And it's just a just an ugly part of the community. Never liked it. It always bothers me. So punk calling out or plugging, I guess, Cornette's podcast didn't even upset me because I can kind of understand. You know, I understand his perspective. It's when the fans just start deciding things are true on their own because if there's one thing wrestling fans love, it's to assume things. It's their number one favorite hobby is just to assume and decide something is true just because they decided in their head. That's the only thing wrestling fans do. So I don't I have any respect for those. But with Punk, he was there. He was in it. He was in the mix. He had a horrible experience. And we've all, I'm sure, have been at jobs before where we have hated. And if there was a podcast out there that would shit on our old job all day, we would listen to it too. So I am not going to give Punk too much of a problem for that. But it was interesting that he did drop uh, Corny's uh, podcasts on Raw. So I'm sure We'll hear all about that, or you guys will. I don't listen, but you guys will hear all about that on Cornette's next slobbering, profanity and laced rant. Um, so he then starts talking about WrestleMania. He talks about how a lot of people have ideas for WrestleMania. They all want him to be here, or all want him to be at WrestleMania, and they've got uh, some ideas like being a referee and a commentator and whatnot. And he said that a lot of people are talking about him. A lot of people like to talk about him. And namely Drew McIntyre, but he also brought up The Rock. And he said, one guy who's not talking about me at all, one guy who has never even mentioned my name, is The Rock. And kind of dropped the old uh, arms are too short to box with God line into the camera. So maybe we can get something in the future between those two. But Punk's got to get healthy first and get through his uh, program uh, with Drew. So that's when he basically calls out, I'm not sure if he calls out Drew McIntyre or if McIntyre came out on his own. But McIntyre's music hits, and he starts coming down to the uh, the ramp, and Punk's like, turn that stupid music off and get your bitch ass in the ring. So Punk is just very intense tonight, and he's not putting up with any shit, yelling at the production team to turn off the stupid music. And he goes, get your ass out here, you and your fucking skirt. 
And then Drew, without even missing a beat, says, hey, careful, this is 2024. You can get canceled for that, you know, implying that Punk is homophobic. He's not. He just said that Drew is wearing a skirt, just like everybody used to say Roddy Piper wore a skirt. So Drew kind of barks back that he'll get canceled. He starts walking around the ring. This is so great. McIntyre's walking around the ring, and he's got, you know, the merch on, the CM Punk merch, and uh, he uh, is showing it off. And Punk said, Punk says, you know what? I never had to put another man's name on a shirt to sell it, which was awesome. And then Drew kind of like takes it off to expose another T-shirt that he's got. I think that might have been the original one. And uh, Drew, Punk saying he never had to put another man's name on a shirt to sell it was a good line. And then Drew immediately barked back with another great one saying, you know, you're a straight edge guy. You don't drink. You don't do drugs. Yet you seem to spend all of your time in rehab. So we got a lot of ooze from the crowd there. And Punk acknowledged the burn. He's like, pretty good. Pretty good. And then Punk or Drew, Drew goes this another. God, there were so many good ones here. Drew McIntyre says that he was the chosen one. And Punk says, who was it? Say his name. Who chose you? Holy shit. Holy shit. Say his name. Who was the one that chose you? Say his name. Oh, my God. And and, and Drew just kind of laughed. And, and Punk was like, I, did, I wasn't the chosen one because, you know, some corporate asshole told me I was. I'm the chosen one because they tell me I am. You know, that type of thing. That was really good when Drew brought up that chosen one shit. And then Punk was like, oh, really? You're the chosen one? Who Who's the one that chose you? What was his name? I forgot. You want to refresh my memory? What's his name again? So good. And that's when... Drew McIntyre pitches CM Punk being the guest commentator. Like, he wants him to be out there. I want you to have to narrate, or I think Seth says that later, but I think that's kind of Seth and Drew's uh, motivation for both. They want, they want Punk to be forced to narrate their greatest moment at WrestleMania. So Drew kind of pitches Punk being the guest commentator, and that's when Seth Rollins comes out. So Seth comes out and get involved in this, and he calls the two of them morons. You two morons don't get to make decisions about a, a championship match because you're not in it. And he pointed at Punk, and uh, he asked the crowd if Punk should be on commentary. Of course, they cheered. But Seth is not being too kind to Punk at all, uh, calling him uh calling him a moron, and then later on he would call both Drew McIntyre and CM Punk, uh, or I'm sorry, Punk would call McIntyre and uh, Rollins a couple of dipshits. So we had lots of cursing. The, the the audio guy was very busy on the mute button tonight. They were even trying to... Uh, I forgot which uh, what chant they were muting, but it, it might have been asshole. forgot what chant they were muting, but it was uh, hearing... You could see the button... You could envision the guy just hitting the button over and over with the chant. I forgot what chant it was. I'm pretty sure it was in this segment, though. But Rollins says uh, about the referee thing, he says to Punk, he goes, you can't be the referee because that's your counting arm. And then Punk just immediately gets down on the mat with his other arm and just goes, one, two, three, and just slaps the mat, gets right up. And he says, that's okay. He says, it's okay that I'm not going to be the referee because I can't be impartial with these two dipshits. <laughs> and that's when uh, McIntyre says, hey, keep it PG. And uh, then Seth goes, Punk, you want to know what I think? And Punk just goes, nope. <laughs> it was just like, boom, boom, boom. It's almost as if, you know, they, they've been rehearsing this for weeks, but I really think a lot of this was, was ad lib. These were three professionals who have been on this stage type of thing before just going out there and trusted to tell the story and they fucking did man i'm sure some of these lines were written and prepared and they were locked and loaded to deliver but you know a lot of the timing here in the back and forth just was really flowing well and it felt more like three guys beefing than three guys reading lines you get what i mean there you know and that's that's just a you know tribute to them like how good they did in this in this segment all three of them was uh really fun and intriguing it was a ride the fans liked it and i think the fans had appreciation for all three of them at some point throughout the segment for things that they said. Rollins, Punk, and and, and uh, McIntyre all made solid points and had solid burns on everyone. And so it was pretty even too, you know? Like, so I'm not sure how much of this was, like I said, was, was ad-libbed or off the cuff. I'm sure a little bit of it was, but I don't think anything 
here was out of bounds. I, I am not expecting to read any sort of reports tomorrow that Punk or Rollins or McIntyre had their feelings hurt or got butt hurt about anything that was said here uh, or any words or a scuffle backstage. I don't think we're going to hear any of that stuff. And like I said from the very beginning, Punk is going to be on his best behavior. Punk is not going to be here to do what he did in AEW, to ruffle feathers and you know to walk around looking for confrontations. He's really going to be on his best behavior. And he should be because he came back and he got injured right away. So, you know, he needs to be thinking about karma and shit like that right now. So Punk just does not seem like the guy that's going to be having a whole ton of issues uh, behind the scenes backstage. And I think Punk and Drew obviously have a good relationship because Drew is driving around Chicago, going to Mindy's. He's playing Crimea River when he's working out. The trolling is just off the charts. It's so good. And I have uh, full confidence without knowing anything or hearing anything or not heard any reports uh, about any of this. It's just me. My, my gut instinct speculation is, is that McIntyre and Punk are having a great time doing this together. And when this program happens, and I'm assuming that McIntyre is re-upped, or at least they are extremely confident that he will re-up. Because I just don't understand how you're going to be having the guy, this guy, do the things he's doing and not and have his contract up in a few weeks seems bizarre to me so i feel like mcintyre will be sticking around punk can hopefully get healthy and i don't know if they could even stretch it to SummerSlam. we might have to get it done before then whenever punk is healthy i think that that match just needs to happen right away him and drew mcintyre and maybe mcintyre will be a champion maybe he won't we really don't know uh but when that when that program happens it should be interesting. I'm hoping that maybe it can kind of be a little bit like Brock and Punk was back in 2013. I mean, McIntyre has been referencing more than once how much bigger he is than CM Punk. <laughs> when he was trying to take the, sh the merch off to reveal the other shirt, he's like, oh, sorry, that one took me a while. My biceps, something you wouldn't know anything about. His gigantic biceps is getting in the way of him taking off his, his shirt. Such good stuff. I like how Punk... Uh, made fun of his stupid sword because it was. I hated that fucking sword. I thought the sword thing was so dumb coming out and sticking to the thing in the pyro. I'm like, God, you know, I mean, I like his look. McIntyre's got a tremendous look. I mean, he's just a fucking big, strong, awesome guy. Uh, but the sword I always thought was lame. And I'm glad that Punk kind of shat on it too. Fun stuff there. But that was just amazing. Like the whole segment was just amazing it's exactly what i want out of my monday night raws you know every now it's a three-hour show so give me a 30-minute promo sometimes it's totally fine and the way this one went i could have had it go another 10 minutes because i was really enjoying what they were all saying to each other and what made it so great is how all of them really did hammer home points that an objective observer would agree with oh he was right about that he was right about that so was he you know and that's when the conflicts are the strongest and they're the best and it's always been that way in wrestling. And this situation here with McIntyre, you know, McIntyre and, and Roman almost are kind of shoved out of the, the limelight here, sort of. And it felt like it was more Seth and, and I keep I keep doing this. It was more, uh, I'm sorry, Rollins. Rollins and Roman kind of shoved in the background here. And then this match was more about Drew and Punk. Earlier in the night, it was more about Cody and The Rock. But I still think that McIntyre and Rollins, even though McIntyre's been so preoccupied with his trolling of punk and the shirts and the music and the fucking with him and all of that, he has been aware of his match with Seth Rollins and has been giving Rollins shit for this very thing. And I'm wondering if that's going to be part of the story because one of the things Rollins, I'm sorry, McIntyre's been saying to Rollins, one of these days I'll know all these guys' names, uh, McIntyre's been telling, the Rollin, telling Rollins in the past few weeks that He's too distracted with Roman and Rock and Cody. You're doing all this. You're overlooking me. And that's going to be a big problem. And now Rollins can kind of turn this around on McIntyre too. Aren't you overlooking me with this punk shit? You know, you're making merch. You're, you know, you're creating merchandise over your issues and your feud with this guy. I don't have a Diarrhea Dwayne shirt, but here you've got your CM Punk graveyard thing and the other one and whatever the else fuck you got. And you seem way more obsessed with CM Punk than I am with taking down the bloodline. So they both have a distraction. And I'm wondering if that is going to somehow find a way to 
show itself in the match. Like, is one guy's distraction going to do him in? And so you got both of those guys with other shit going on. Then you got Punk in the middle, and they kind of like... It's the circle chart or whatever that thing's called, where all those circles kind of intersect, you know? And Punk is kind of in the middle. Rollins got his own thing over here with Cody and uh, and Roman and, and Rock, but then he's also got this thing with McIntyre, who's also got this thing with Punk, you know? And, and Punk and Cody were the last two in the Rumble. You know, it all kind of like really, really intertwines nicely, and it makes you, it keeps you on your toes because two days after WrestleMania 39, uh, maybe two weeks, right after WrestleMania 39, and we started talking about next year. And I feel like Cody was on a lot of our radars almost immediately. You know, I kind of still thought the Money in the Bank and Madison Square Garden happens could still happen. Some people thought SummerSlam could still happen. But once it became clear that it's probably going to be Cody and Roman again at WrestleMania 40, my big concern was predictability. And I was even a little bit Worried about Rollins, too, because, you know, whatever he did, whoever his opponent wound up being, I felt like that could be a predictable situation, too. And now you've got so many layers to both of these championship matches with Seth and Drew. You've got all of Seth's distractions and you got Drew's distractions and you got Punk in the middle, who's definitely going to play a role here, definitely in that in that match somehow. And you got Damian Priest that I think is also going to be a factor. So that's a lot layered on there. And then Roman and and, uh, Cody is the same thing because it's probably going to be bloodline rules. Plus you have the previous night's match and all of the other what ifs and who's going to get involved. I think WWE's done a great job of making at least the two championship matches at the top with the men. Not that predictable. I don't really, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do next week in my predictions and what I'm going to say. Got to really think about this because... I feel like with Punk and, or I'm sorry, with Seth and McIntyre, it could go either way on that. I think the two of them or Priest all have, at this point, an equal chance of walking out of WrestleMania as World Heavyweight Champion. So we will have to see. But this was the best. This was so fun. And I'm glad Punk is going to be at WrestleMania. I'm glad they're working him in. I'm glad he's going to be a part of not only the show, but a part of this match, because I think that's really important. And that's crucial because him and Rollins or him and McIntyre, excuse me, are definitely going to be facing later on in the year, probably this summer. By the way, by the end of the uh, segment, when Punk tries to have the last word. He calls out both guys for their stupid outfits. He calls out Seth Rollins' wife, and he calls out Drew's stupid sword, and then he starts to leave. That's when McIntyre, who was sitting on the announce table for all of this, he gets up and he goes, no, no, Punk, you don't get to have the last word. I do. And he gets in and starts talking shit, and then Rollins hits him with a super kick and a stomp. So Rollins stood tall in this. Drew got his ass kicked. Punk got out scot-free. And uh, Rollins stood there after stomping McIntyre. So the little brawl and the stomp at the end was the perfect little cherry on top to what was a great segment. Punk, Rollins, McIntyre, great stuff. So fun. My God, I could talk about that segment for another 30 minutes. Uh, What did you guys think about it? Oh, yeah, Punk's reaction when Seth's music hit was hilarious. He kind of had that, like, ah, fuck me, you know, type of thing. And I was worried that Seth was going to kind of ruin what was a great exchange between these two but he didn't he he made it better or he at least didn't ruin it um okay thank you for that juliet oh i thought uh, i actually thought uh, we already knew that though wwe just announced roman will be with the rock on next week's go home raw i thought i heard them say that on raw juliet so i think i actually did know that i already knew that juliet i knew it already i knew it yeah, Max Pokebrook, Jim Cornette is the top three best managers of all time. First two being Bobby Heenan and Paul Heyman. I cannot disagree with that. Uh, that's what always bothers me about Jim Cornette is like, I loved him as a manager. I loved him as a talent, loved him as a promo. He was so good. Uh, he was he was the epitome of a Southern wrestling manager, and he was so good. And nobody in the business, inside or outside of the ring, I don't think could talk better than him, which is why his podcast is so successful. I just wish he wouldn't cater to the slime. He caters to slime. He caters to people who are miserable and love to hate shit because they're angry. 
and they're just angry. They're just angry and miserable and they fucking hate the world and they're just looking for people to shit on. It's just, I don't know. I just don't, I don't understand the mentality. I guess you know, see, I'm getting older and I'm just not fucking stupid. Uh, I just don't understand that mentality, but it's everywhere. And it's a shame because Cornette was a hell of a wrestling manager. And I think he's a hall of fame worthy manager easily. He should have, and probably would have already been in had he just not had so many bridge burning situations in his life. He's a lot like CM Punk doesn't seem to really get along with people no matter where he is and has falling outs wherever he goes, everywhere, everywhere, <laughs> everywhere he's been just like CM Punk. There's been something that something happened, whether it be TNA or ring of honor or WCW or WWE, wherever Jim was, something would always happen. Uh, Zane, what's up, man? Punk on commentary during 40, good or bad? I think good. I think I'm okay with that. Maybe not like the whole show, but if he's just going to be out there for the Rollins and Drew match, I think that's fine because we've done that before, you know, shit, WrestleMania 13, like Sean was on commentary, remember? And there's probably more examples of uh, things like that where talent has been injured. The Punk thing kind of reminds me of Sean because Sean lost his smile and then February, in February left and then he decided he wanted to come back right before WrestleMania 13. So they worked him in. They put him on commentary for a couple matches. I think the main event, he was definitely out there. And he was just kind of like around. He was on the uh, Slammies the night before, you know, not as a wrestler. He was winning Slammies for all the shit that he did the previous year, uh, but he uh, didn't get in the ring. So maybe, you know, Punk just doing commentary for one match. I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, Andrew McGurn, thank you for the two bucks. Rock said, I'm going to make you bleed tonight. Oh. Oh, okay. Some people probably could read lips. I didn't go back and watch the replay. Okay, so that's good, Andrew. That means that makes sense. That means there is no other secret that Roman's hiding, or I'm sorry, Rock is hiding or holding over Cody. There's no other leverage. He just said to him, I'm going to make you bleed tonight. Okay. And that might have been enough to make Cody be like, what the fuck does that mean? I still think Cody should have fucking punched him and attacked him for saying that. But if he said, I'm going to make you bleed tonight, because it was just like one line, wasn't it? I mean, it didn't look like he just said one sentence. That very well could have been what he said and probably was. I kind of believe you, Andrew. <laughs> I don't know if you're making that up or if that's like what's going on on the, on the Twitters. But just thinking about it in my head, what he said, I'm like, yeah, that probably makes sense. I'm going to make you bleed tonight. Then he does, shows up at the end, annihilates Cody. There you go. Fun shit, man. Spaz Phoenix has got five. They had to bring in the Little Tron for that crowd tonight. I wouldn't mind them keeping it. I like the minimalist sets. I uh, think that that's kind of cool. So, And Allstate's not a big arena. It's small. So you are probably losing a couple thousand seats when you do that. So, you, so if you have like the normal stage, you can probably only fit 10 to 12, 10 to 13,000 maybe in there. You open that up, open up another two to 3,000 seats. Fuck yeah, I'd do it. Especially in Chicago, big city, little, little building. Obviously, you're going to sell that one out. And it's always been a big market for WWE. But even in the shitty days, WWE always did good numbers in Chicago. So I'm not sure if this is some, you know, really great flex or anything. I would hope, I would hope <laughs> that a Monday Night Raw with uh, CM Punk in Chicago and Cody Rhodes and The Rock and all that shit on it two weeks before WrestleMania would do a good attendance number. Uh, I think anything less than a sellout would have been a disappointment. So uh, WWE on fire with their attendance, but... This is one that I'm not really impressed with. I'm impressed with those 15,000 attendance house shows that they run, you know, every couple of weeks. They're doing 10 to 15K for house shows and shit. Doing 15K in Chicago two weeks before WrestleMania, you fucking better do that many. But I like that WWE does have contingency plans for when they know attendance is going to be off the charts. Hey, we can just run with a, a smaller set to open up more seats. I'm glad that they have options and it's not just one we have a raw set and we have a uh, holy shit the attendance is going to be off the charts set and i'm glad that they can use them uh when it's appropriate and they probably did know all along that they were going to use this for chicago i don't think they thought about this last night oh let's bust out the small one they probably intended when the show was announced and the tickets went on sale selling those seats so and then i guess if they didn't sell then they'd put the normal stage back up but of course they're going to sell. It's two weeks until WrestleMania, and it's Chicago. The next match we had on Monday Night Raw, we are an hour and a half into this uh, podcast, and we're talking about our second match. Fun. 
uh, was Candice LeRae and Ivy Nile. So Candice is continuing her uh, progression in here uh, as a heel. Indy Hartwell's at ringside. And I wasn't looking, paying much attention to this match because we just got finished with that great McIntyre, Rollins, and Punk segment. I started working on my thumbnail for the video. So I'm watching it, but I'm like, I'm trying to get an image of Punk and Drew and everything so I can put on here. And uh, I see that Candice is kind of faking a, a leg injury a little bit. She's kind of acting like she's hurt. And that was enough to distract Ivy Nile. She capitalized on that, took advantage, won the match by rolling her up. Indy Hartwell did not like it. She's kind of like, what the fuck? So they're slow burning this, but Candice is about to turn into what I can only expect to maybe be like what Alexa Bliss was or something. You know, Candice is a really good little worker and I would like to, I'm hoping that this heel turn amounts to something because now that she's in the process of turning heel, she's uh, lining up some victories, which is good. We haven't seen her string up a bunch of wins yet. Uh, I just haven't really liked Candice as a baby face. She's a little bit just too plain and simple for me coming out with the butterfly wings and all that. You know, it's not, I want that Candace, the Lorraine that takes the uh, lumbar check to the moon. I want that one. The one that's in like hardcore matches with dude, she's a spitfire. So if they can kind of tap into some of that again, that would be great, but I'm going to be holding out cautious optimism because I like Candice LeRae. I like Johnny Gargano. I want them to both do well. Uh, so hopefully this heel run is something that she can sink her teeth into as a character and hopefully get some traction. Because as a baby face, she's been largely invisible, you know, on the roster. So this is good that they're trying it. And I know uh, Triple H likes her. Uh, DIY took on the New Day next. They had a little uh, altercation backstage where they Kind of threw some shade. Miz and Truth were a part of that. They were going to be out here for commentary. Truth, as usual, typical Truth. He's confused. He doesn't know what fucking day it is or year backstage or on commentary, but he's got to do commentary for this. Uh, Michael Cole, it was adorable. Michael Cole lets our Truth take us to break during the match. Why don't you take us to break, Truth? And then Truth goes, okay, we'll be, we'll be right back after these following messages or something just really adorable. He's the best. Got to love our Truth. The match, I think, ended in a no contest when Judgment Day attacked both teams in the aisle way and beat the shit out of The Miz and R-Truth as well. And Damian Priest does have a lot of aggression in him and really does seem to uh, have it out for R-Truth. We'll see if that plays into WrestleMania in any way. One idea I do have about this, and it ties into what I've been saying in my last three podcasts. In my last three podcasts each, I've spent about five minutes discussing what I believe is the importance of Damian Priest doing something with the briefcase at WrestleMania, because he's going to have two champions wrestling both nights. That's four opportunities in some way, shape, or fashion to cash in and win the championship. And if he doesn't win the championship or he doesn't attempt to cash in, they better have a damn good reason for him not to. In Saudi Arabia, Sami Zayn stole the briefcase and ran away. There was the other show, I don't remember when now, when he got in trouble, he got busted, mommy uh, grounded him and took his briefcase away. <laughs> so he couldn't cash it in there. And if he's going to have a situation where he can cash in and he doesn't, then they better explain why he doesn't. I think our truth could be that explanation. I think at WrestleMania, because that's the thing you got to think about in WWE's mind. And that's what I've been trying to say here. I'm like, okay, creatively, WWE might not want Priest to cash in at WrestleMania. We know we want Cody to finish his story and we want Rollins and McIntyre and Punk to still continuing to tell that. And right now is not the time to make Priest the champion. So they need to do something on the show to take that opportunity away from him. And if he keeps targeting and beating down our truth the way he does, maybe he comes out to attempt to cash in and our truth fucks it over or fucks him over and screws it up. And that would be great. But the problem is you can't get much of a program out of that. Those guys, you know, truth and Damian priest, you'd get, you know, maybe one match on raw or pay-per-view match where priest just kills him. Uh, but Otherwise, it might be looked at as a letdown run for Damian Priest. But truth, you know, the way, you know, the way Priest is has been telling this story with our truth and their relationship, I could definitely see our truth intentionally or unintentionally uh, being the reason that Priest doesn't cash in at WrestleMania. You know, maybe it's not even something like he he comes out and stops him. Maybe it's something silly, like he picks up his briefcase and he wants to go get it washed 
Oh man, looks like a bird took a shit on priest briefcase. I'm going to go wash it off for him. <laughs> and then he takes it like to a car wash and you cut to the car wash and our truth has got the big and he's hosing it down. And then meanwhile, in the ring, like Roman and Seth Rollins are both completely unconscious. They're, un they're in a coma. They're in a coma in the ring, both of them. And Priest is like, where the fuck is my briefcase? And then Rhea's like, I think I saw our truth with it. And then call him. And then he picks up the few FaceTimes from the uh, he FaceTimes from the car wash, hosing down. Oh man, yeah, I saw bird shit on your briefcase. So I'm washing it off. Truth, the champions are down in the ring. Something like that. I know that's really campy and hokey and silly for wrestling, but I don't know. I like silly shit. And something like that could work because I've been kind of harping on that. You guys are probably hearing sick of hearing me talk about it. Okay, Greg, we get it. He's got to cash in the briefcase. But you no, know, seriously though, they need to. If he's not going to cash it in and they don't want him to, then they need to make some sort of storyline on-screen reason as to why he's not. I will say that every fucking day until WrestleMania. Andrade was up next, taking on Giovanni Vinci. Now, this was a replacement for Ivar, who was injured, not medically cleared. Uh, I walked away during this match. I know Andrade won, but I didn't see the finish. So Andrade won, obviously didn't see the finish, but I think it would be really weird if Giovanni Vinci won that match. So I'm just going to go ahead and Use my gut instinct to believe that Andrade won that, but I did not see the finish. Then it was time for the Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch promo, and this one was really good. And I wouldn't, I wasn't even, wouldn't even be normally sure if a promo between these two women would really be great on a normal Raw, much less one that had to follow the surprise of The Rock showing back up and then the bonker segment between Rollins, Punk, and McIntyre. So now I was like, oh man, these women are going to have to follow that. That's going to be tough. Rhea and Dom were out first. And she was talking about someone not giving her the proper attention, you know, meaning Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch comes out and she says, hey, I didn't have to confront you after you had a grueling match the way you've done to me the past three weeks. Which I liked. And then Rhea Ripley kind of, you know, Shows her dominance over Becky Lynch a little bit. Even Dominic, you know, tries to say a couple words earlier, and the fans, of course, boo the shit out of him. And so when Rhea starts talking to Becky, she says, is talking about basically how bad she's going to fuck her up, how badly she's going to beat her at WrestleMania. And she goes, I'm going to annihilate you at WrestleMania, but I'm not going to completely kill you. <laughs> I'm going to leave you alive. That way you can sit next to your daughter and you can hear her call me mommy. And... Becky and I and I thought Becky was gonna be typical Becky overact, uh, overinflect <gasps> deep breaths in between her shit like she does. And there's a lot of there's a lot about Becky's promo that make me cringe my nuts off sometimes. But this was really good. She was great, and she's kind of like, okay, okay, that that's your one free pass. You mention my daughter's name again, it'll be the last words you ever say. And she said, my dad never got to meet my daughter. And it might be a joke to you, but it's not a joke to me. And the way she was, you know, delivering the line, looking Rhea in the eye, so good. I mean, it was really good. It almost got me choked up, you know, because Becky, you know, a lot of times when, you know, you try to you, you try to draw from personal experience to get the proper emotions out, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And we've seen instances in the past where somebody has tried, you know, Cody was kind of like this in AEW a little bit. You know, he's try, trying too hard to cry type of thing. She didn't have to try very hard here. You know, it was it was coming out and I really liked it. I thought, you know, it was like, okay, we're bringing up a dead family member, but not in a like a disrespectful way. It's more like of a regret. You know, I wish my dad could have met this daughter whose name you're speaking. And this stuff's very important to me, not a joke. You're getting personal now and now you're crossing the line. And I liked it. I really did. I thought it was fucking great. And then Dom, you know, Dom picks always the best moments to stick his uh, sexy face into everything, doesn't he? And I think Becky full-blown punched him. If anything, on the uh, on the sheets tomorrow, on the websites, I want to read if Dominic has a broken jaw because Becky clocked him and he went down like a ton of bricks and then her and Rhea went at it. And that was great. I'm like, yes! Because what I thought was going to happen is she was going to deck Dom and then Rhea would powder out and retreat. But no, they started going right at it. Boom, boom, just trading rights. And uh, 
pull apart, you know, officials come out to pull them apart and they're really just kind of prying these women off of each other. And I'm like, yes, that's what we needed. That was very good. You know, you know, it might be a cheap way to kind of create heat for this feud, but I do think it needed it a little bit. Becky and Rhea looks great on paper. Becky and Rhea looks great on the marquee. You know, that's a match of two, you know, super duper stars in the women's division, but you still don't have a whole lot of an issue with these two, you know, that's personal. It's more of, you know, Becky, you know, won the rumble, you know, so, or no, did she win the chamber? What the fuck happened? Yeah, she won the chamber. So I think now that was something that it could, it could have easily not been good. It could be something that I'm talking about right now, rolling my eyes about, oh my God. And then Becky brought up her daughter and it was all fucking stupid, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was good. And you know, when I've, I've, I keep saying this, you know, when you watch wrestling for 40 years, anything that can actually pull on your heartstrings at this point is as numb as I am to like literally everything that I've seen. I don't take that for granted, you know? So when I've, when I can see something, a segment that, you know, not only entertains me that, but kind of gets me caught up in the emotion of it after all of these years, it's, it's emotions and feelings in wrestling that I, for the past 10 years, I kind of didn't think were ever going to be possible again, you know, and then AEW comes around and WWE gets white hot, you know, in, in my, you know, my excitement in the business has just been rejuvenated because we're having so many of these moments, so many of these type of segments and moments now that were scarce for years and now are kind of a regular thing in both companies. And this was a real good one here. Becky and uh, Rhea had a good segment here. This has got me reinvested in the match. I've kind of been just slightly interested in it. I am interested in Rhea and Becky. Uh, I am kind of where we sit now, still of the belief or hope even that maybe Rhea should just retain. I don't see what the point is to have Becky beat her right now. I feel like Rhea Ripley should retain. I'd have Bailey beat EO Sky, but maybe not Becky Lynch beat Rhea Ripley and have Rhea just really add add to her legacy here, you know, and make her, you know, a, a rival to uh, Bianca Belair. And I think those two need to clash next year at WrestleMania 41. And I think uh, Rhea Ripley at least retaining here against Becky is is something I'd be fine with at this point, but we'll see. God, predictions videos coming up soon. Next week, guys. Next week. All right. After that was Bronson Reed and Sami Zayn. This one was interesting. Sami Zayn, he, of course, is facing Gunther for the Intercontinental title. Uh, Gable has kind of gotten in his head a little bit, telling him that he can't beat Gunther. Gunther has gotten in his head a little bit as well, and now he's got to go out there and face Big Bronson Reed. And the origin of uh, Bronson Reed's name, nickname Big, comes from, it's a crazy story. It comes from when he was younger and he was getting older and becoming an adult. And he started to get really big. And everybody who knew him recognized and realized how big he was getting. And they said, you know what? Your name should be Big Bronson Reed. And that's where it came from. So always tune into this podcast for, you know, you know, educational stories like that if you want to know nickname origins. But anyway, Big Bronson Reed defeats Sami Zayn, just beats him. Now, Gunther had a little bit to do with this. He was on the show tonight, interviewed backstage earlier on with Kathy Kelly, came out to the stage here, just distracted, just fucked with Sami. He didn't even come all the way to the ring. He just came to the stage. Sami saw him, was kind of distracted by him the whole match. And then when he had uh, Bronson in a luva kick position, he hesitated. And then it was too late. Bronson uh, took him down. Sentoned him, went to the top, hit him with a tsunami, and won the match. And that it, it was basically a clean victory, so to speak, there. And that was really interesting. And then backstage, uh, you would see um Sami Zayn with Chad Gable again. He they kind of patched things up earlier, like before the match, they ran into each other and they sort of smoothed things over from their conversation from the previous week. And then he runs into Gable again after the match, and Sammy admits that Gunther got in his head, you know, and uh, not only does Gable not think he can beat Gunther, but Gunther knows he can't beat Gunther, and Gable said he needs a different approach, and when you're ready to listen, and when you're ready for that new approach, then you let me know, and then Sammy kind of like nods. So now I don't know if it's going to be Gable, you know, helping train Sammy or you know, be a part of this, I guess is kind of good. I wanted Gable to get the championship match against Gunther. I wanted him to face Gunther at WrestleMania, but then they kind of 
stop telling you that story for a while. And then Gable turned back up in that gauntlet match. But by then I felt like if it was going to be Gable, they would have continued to, to talk about Gable on this road, this desire to get back and challenge Gunther again. And the fact that they forgot about it for a couple of months made me think that he wasn't going to win anyway. But now that he's back, he's back in this situation, he could maybe back up Sami Zayn or, uh, train him and oh and maybe turn on him you know that's something they could do here gable i'm pretty sure in, in one of those previous vignettes or video packages or whatever talking about the intercontinental title i think not only it's kind of like cody you know it's not just winning the championship it's beating roman and i think gable might have that same thing with gunther yes i want to win the intercontinental title but it's important me important to me to not just win the title but beat gunther he's the one i want to beat Sammy is now standing in the way of that, and maybe Gable is going to give him some bad advice, you know, or say, here, here's what you want to do, and it's maybe not what he really wants to do. And maybe Gable has a, has a hand in Sami Zayn not winning the Intercontinental title so he can be the one to beat Gunther himself. They might wind up doing that, uh, but with Sammy continuing to lose here, fighting from underneath, you've got a champion in Gunther who is to the point of overconfidence now. Now he's seeing his opponent, who he's already taking lightly, losing matches just a couple of weeks out of their big title match at WrestleMania. The character Gunther is probably building up so much confidence that that might wind up being his downfall. So if it's Sami Zayn, you know, in this uphill battle against Gunther, that's the story they're going to tell to beat Gunther for the first time is to, or to end this intercontinental run, I should say, is to have his confidence get the best of him, you know, and he's going to take Sami Zayn too lightly, not appreciate and respect the amount of fight in him. And when he has an opportunity to beat him, he's not gonna. And then Sami Zayn's going to capitalize and win the title. And that's how Gunther's run ends. That sounds like a likely scenario, but, you know, Gable is going to fit into that somehow. So, you know, maybe Gable is there. Maybe he's just a corner man for Sami Zayn. You know, and a couple of times during the match when Gunther has Sammy kind of uh, on the ropes a bit, he scoots out and gets some advice from Gable. Who knows? Maybe we've got a little bromance forming here uh, between these two. We will see. Uh, but with Sammy and Gunther, I'm kind of fine either way. That scenario I just laid out with Gunther's overconfidence, getting the best of him and Sammy beating him, having the moment at WrestleMania, ending that streak a year after ending the Usos tag streak. Would be great for Sammy, but then again, I'm such a big Gunther fan. Fuck, if they want to keep running with him, I'm fine with it. I said that last year. Everybody had him pegged. Everybody's prediction video for WrestleMania, everybody's predictions had Gunther losing. I did not. I said, he's going to win. He did. He beat them both. So I wouldn't rule him out to lose this year either. He very well could retain over Sami Zayn, especially if Gable is involved here because he could be a factor, a big factor in that. And that left us, of course, with the main event, Jey Uso taking on Shinsuke Nakamura. Now, backstage earlier on, Jey Uso had a promo, and Solo and Jimmy showed up. So they made their presence known earlier on in the night with Jey Uso. So we should have seen that, you know, maybe The Rock was still going to be there, but that was just not on my radar. Jey Uso, Nakamura, pretty decent match. Jey Uso won with a spear. Jimmy Uso, I think, did make an appearance, and Cody kind of he uh, headed him off, and the camera cut to Cody and Jimmy. And Solo, I think, brawling in the back during the match. And then when the match was over, they returned to the fight. And that's, of course, when Cody and Jimmy were fighting. And then he was hit from behind by The Rock. And we talked about that earlier on. Rock throws him out in the rain, bloodies him up, beats the shit out of him up against his bus, gets out that white weight belt, puts Cody's blood all over it, says Mama Rhodes on it, calling out Cody's mom. Oh, my God. And just beating up Cody, talking shit to him when he does. And he showed up unannounced. We had no idea he was going to be there. He came out in the opening segment during the Cody Rhodes promo, approached Cody, said something, whispered something in his ear. We didn't know what that was. I thought it was a, a bigger part of the story, maybe some crazy leverage he's got over Cody. Apparently, all he said was, I'm going to make you bleed tonight. And he did. He, we saw not only Punk, Rollins, and Cody all use colorful language tonight. Cody got actual color on his face. And we had Rock holding him by the face, the bloody face. It was great shit, man. This is what a WrestleMania season Monday Night Raw should be, especially one that's coming so close to 
WrestleMania just a couple of weeks away. That's the way it was back in the day. We had a lot of really, really fun Monday Night Raws as we got close to those WrestleMania 15s and 16s and 17s and 18s and stuff. And we haven't really had a lot of that in many years. And this was one of the better WrestleMania season Monday Night Raws I can remember in recent memory. You guys are going to be better at that than me. So if you can think of better raws during WrestleMania season than this one, remind me which ones they were. I mean, I'm talking post Attitude Era, like anything in the last 15 years. Has anything in the last 15 years come anything close to this? Uh, you know, from like 2009 or eight up until now, I I can't think of a, a raw that was this big in terms of the WrestleMania build and the current stories told. We had some just massive segments tonight. Massive segments. I think uh, every Punk has had a couple of home runs. I mean, he's a lot like Cody. Like Cody had that disappointment last week with Roman on SmackDown and then followed up big here. But if you remember Punk's first promo after the Survivor Series, not good. Everybody was like, ah, God, that was nothing. He didn't say anything. But he immediately changed that next time he was in the ring. And then we had that big face-off with him and Rollins, and that was great stuff. And then him and Cody had that epic deal, you know, around the Rumble time. I mean, he every time he's in the ring, he just, you know, has these epic moments. And I think him and Rollins and McIntyre just had such perfect chemistry and flow in that whole segment tonight. It was uh, it was great. I'm a, I'm a giddy. I'm a giddy WWE fan tonight. That's for sure. Good stuff from our friends in Greenwich, Connecticut. Let's go back to the chat. Let's go back to the chat. Yeah, Isaac, I agree. Feels like uh, one of the best mania seasons we've had in years. <clears throat> Green P, yeah, the only flaw Ricochet has is his mic work. Uh, he's, he's no Will Ospreay on the mic, that's for sure. Uh, he needs... Uh, I always thought, I've said this before, Ricochet looks to me, he looks like the guy uh, in Clueless and in Scrubs, you know, the bald guy. <clears throat> he's in Clueless, he's in Scrubs, uh, maybe something else. That's just the two things I know him from. You know who I'm talking about. And think about that guy with like a, a goatee. He looked just like Ricochet. But Ricochet just seems a little too nice and normal, you know. But he's an athlete. I feel like maybe... Have they ever tried to go heel with him? I mean, it's so hard to have athletes like that be heels. But <clears throat> if you try to go in the Carmelo Hayes direction with him or something and slap a pair of glasses on him or something like that and just make him a cocky asshole, he's got a hot, smoking hot girlfriend or fiancé, you know, announcing everybody every night, he could somehow try to develop some sort of an attitude. Maybe if you... Gave him a IC or US title run. I don't know what you do with Ricochet uh, at this point, but he's stupidly good and uh, always, always has been. I think that's about the end of my notes, unless there's anything else you guys want to talk about. Oh, Max, that was so good. You're the chosen one? Who chose you? What's his name? I mean, the fact that they're kind of bringing up the Vince stuff. I mean, they got edgy tonight. They got edgy. They were cursing. We saw blood. They're referencing Vince McMahon. Oh, my God. Punk is dropping Jim Cornette podcast references and stuff. What a raw. This was a this was a wild one. Oh, sorry, Zane G. You sent me. You know what? I'm gonna go to the other uh, screen here because I uh could have missed some super chats. So let's just do that real quick so I can see what I've got. And that way you guys have a chance to answer or ask more questions. By the way, if anybody is watching right now is not a subscriber, please become one. We are going to hit 42,000 uh, in probably just a day or so, which is kind of nice. Uh, let me see. Where are we? There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, Zane, sorry. I think yours got buried and I missed it, so I'm going to go hunting for it. I don't see it. Hold on, bro. Please hold. Huh. Oh, Fox Star Killer. I missed one from you. No, I didn't. 
<laughs> that was the other day. Well, I don't see any ones that I've missed right now, bro, but I will catch those up if I screwed up. But apparently I think I've got them all according to this. There we go. Now I'm caught up. <laughs> Samantha Heel announcer. That would be cool. You know, DJ, another thing that was interesting about this Raw, you know, he said it's the most fun he's had watching Raw. I had a couple of like loud out loud scream out loud moments. Like the first one was when the rock showed up. I was like, holy shit. And I was about two or three minutes behind. Like I had paused my D my recording or I'd paused the show to go do something. I came back and resumed it. So I saw the rock come out probably three minutes after it happened, but I'm like, I just was like, what? And I kind of yelled, Elizabeth kind of was walking around the house. I'm like the fucking rock showed up. He's not even supposed to show up. So that was big. And then during the, Rollins and Punk and McIntyre segment, some of those burns, some of those jabs, some of those insults and lines thrown at each other was getting a pop out of me, like a verbal pop. Like normally I just kind of sit and shut up and don't say anything, but I mean, there was a lot of wows and oohs and holy fuck coming out of my mouth tonight while I was watching Raw. And again, that's just not something that I have done a lot of in, you know, so many years. So I don't want to, I don't want to go too crazy with the praise on this Monday Night Raw, but it definitely was really good to see an episode like this and good to see WWE so far. What I've noticed this year's WrestleMania season from the rock coming in until now, every time we've had a little brief moment of panic, it's like immediately gotten better or, or fixed, you know, and like, oh shit, that kind of sucked. And then like, oh, this is better. Or Oh no, the Rock is here. He's going to take the match from Cody and work with Roman. Oh, never mind. No, we're not. Well, shit. Well, now you make Cody made you make Cody look like an idiot. And now, how are you going to explain this? This is all going to suck. And then, nope, it doesn't. They turn Rock into a heel and they do this whole thing. And he slaps Cody. And now this gets all interesting. And then, oh no, Roman and Cody. That match feels like it's taking a back seat. And on Friday, why didn't they shake hands? And why is Cody, you know, why is Cody like this? And then. We turn around here on Monday Night Raw and they hit us with a surprise rock return, another confrontation with Cody, a brawl, a bloody Cody, you know, a, a Cody now that has been attacked and humiliated to the point where I can't see how this isn't going to change him. I can't see how this, how the bloodline, I think, feels like they are just giving themselves an advantage by doing this to Cody going into mania where really it's probably going to light a fire under Cody. And now not only is he fighting for his father, he's fighting for his mother. And when you think about all these motivations, you know, for the, you can, I'm, I'm fine with fans who are rooting for Roman Reigns. If you're rooting for Roman Reigns to, to beat Cody, good. You should root for your favorites. I'm fine with that. If you're a fan like me and a fan like us who analyze things and you're of the belief that Roman should beat Cody and uh, retain, you're a fool. Because he shouldn't. <laughs> if you're a fan watching and you're a total fucking mark like we all used to be, and I wish I kind of still was, then yes, root for Roman. I don't give a shit. But you can't sit here and tell me that the best thing for WWE would be for Roman to retain. No, it would not. And plus, with the story and Cody and all of these motivations now, you know, think about how all year... Whenever it was brought up about Cody's story, who's he finishing the story for? He's finishing it for his dad. And now at the last minute, we've worked mama into this. And so what more motivation for a son, for a champion son, to go out there and beat and win a championship than to do it for your mama and daddy? I mean, it's the ultimate motivation. I mean, there should be nothing stopping Cody. That's why I don't think bloodline rules is going to be enough. He's going to be a man fucking possessed and he's going to have all the motivation a man could want or dream of or a competitor or a wrestler could dream of. He's got he's fighting for himself. He's fighting for his family, literally fighting for his family. It would be awesome if uh, Tony Khan or AEW would let Dustin do something and like let The Rock attack Dustin like at his gym or something like how fucking good would that be? Like, where is that? Like, where do the rules lie for that? Like, if it's just shot on a cell phone camera. Rock shows up at Dustin's house and beats him up in his chicken coop. And then somebody films it and then WWE posts it to their Instagram. How, how is that breach of contract? I don't know, but that would be pretty cool if he did that. And then maybe Cody would literally be fighting for his whole family. But, you know, now with working mama roads into it, 
I can't see Cody really needing any more fuel than what he has now to work with. He should have all of the motivation and all of the drive you would think necessary to go to WrestleMania and take care of business. And then, like I said earlier, I, this is something that I would, might almost expect on a go home. Like what we saw tonight is something I might would have wanted to see last week, or I'm sorry, next week, but maybe the reason they're not doing it that way is because Rock and Roman are going to win that tag. And next week on the go home, Cody and Seth need to get the upper hand. So you're going to have Cody, Seth, Rock and Roman all on hand next week in Brooklyn, another Huge market for WWE, and if we saw a lot of great shit tonight in Chicago, you would think we're going to see equally good crap next week in Brooklyn. So that is going to be a big deal, and I think next week is when Cody might get one back on the rock. Maybe Cody hits him with a crossroads in the middle of the ring and stands over him, something like that. And then when you get to night one, Cody and Rome, I'm sorry, Rock and Roman win their match, and then Cody wins the title on night two. That's... Kind of the way I see it all uh, all playing out there. But what a night. What a night. What a fun night. And I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me on this Monday Night Raw review. It was a wild one. Pleasantly surprised how well this Monday Night Raw went. I couldn't be happier. So I am going to sign off now. Let's see. Another busy week ahead. I have got uh, ne- uh, one week from today, by the way. Uh, that is April 1st, right? It's going to be a big one, guys. One week from today on the channel, not only are we going to be here next Monday night talking about Monday Night Raw and what we see from The Rock's appearance next week, but I'm going to be dropping a special video that day. Uh, We'll drop that at uh, noon Eastern time. It's going to be the top 10 WrestleMania matches of all time. So that'll drop on Monday morning. Then we will be here Monday evening to talk about Monday Night Raw. So that'll be one week from tonight. But prior to that, this coming Sunday, our final WrestleMania watch-along of the season is set and ready and scheduled. It's going to be WrestleMania 13. Now, Sunday is Easter Sunday, so join us Easter Sunday. We did an Easter stream last year. We watched a backlash. So we'll be up here Easter Sunday to watch a very bloody Steve Austin. Bloody Easter Sunday is what we'll be watching on this watch along week and then you are also going to get something else from me midweek and maybe another collab before we get to the final show and a lot of stuff that is going to be changing after wrestlemania that i'm kind of excited about so just kind of stay tuned exciting shit going down and i'm so happy to have you guys with me along on this ride and i appreciate you guys being here tonight enjoy the rest of your monday evening kick back relax and reflect on what was a kick-ass Monday Night Raw tonight. I will see you guys in just a couple of days. Enjoy your Monday night, and I will be talking to you real soon.